Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern bar cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome back to another episode of the Modern Bar Cart Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Koslick, and this is going to be another one of our Barkhart Foundations episodes where we take a deep dive into the tools and techniques that can really help you revolutionize your cocktail game at home. Our topic is homemade syrups, and I'll explain why I chose this topic in a few minutes here, but first, just a couple quick announcements and, of course, our featured cocktail. Announcement number one is that we've been running a Father's Day special all week long, giving you 15% off any purchase at modernbarcarts.com when you enter the code Big Daddy, all one word, at checkout. And this still qualifies for the free shipping on orders over $40. So you could really do some damage here if you've been waiting for a sweet sale to load up on your cocktail mixers. Unfortunately, this sale doesn't have a whole lot of time left on it, so if you live near Washington, D.C., and you can get your order in by the end of the day today, Thursday, June 14th, 2018, then we'll get those in the mail and hopefully get them to you by Father's Day. If not, you know, it's still a great sale, and we'll keep that coupon code live through Sunday, so you'll have all weekend to place an order, uh, especially if you don't need to have it by Sunday. On a related note, T-shirts are in. That's big announcement number two. We get a lot of requests at events from folks who want modern bar cart branded tees, and we finally made it happen. A little bit about these shirts. They're made from a hyper soft poly cotton rayon blend, sporting the modern bar cart logo on the front and our company tagline, style served up, across the shoulders on the back. We've got both men's and women's cuts available in small, medium, large, and XL, the sizes you'd expect. And in terms of sizing, I will say that these run just a little bit large. So if you're debating between two sizes, it might be worth erring on the small side if you're looking for a more athletic fit or staying at your usual size if you like to wear something with a bit more room. I will also tell you that everyone who's bought a shirt so far has said the exact same thing to me. Oh my God, these are ridiculously soft. And when I'm wearing mine around the house, my wife keeps on finding weird excuses to like pet the shirt. And I honestly don't know how I feel about that. But the point is, please buy one, wear it all the time, and be prepared for some potentially non-consensual petting once people discover how soft it is. The price on these shirts is $19.99. The color is a nice charcoal gray, which is great for active wear during the summer, especially if you live somewhere on the warmer or more humid side, like here in Washington, D.C., the swamp, as they say. And the logo and the tagline are both in modern bar cart orange. We've got pics on the website and social media, so head on over there and check them out. Thanks for staying with me through those fun little announcements. And as a reward, let's give you the chance to make yourself a drink. This week's featured cocktail is the Mint Julep. And I know this might have been slightly more relevant about a month ago when the Kentucky Derby was happening, but I've got my reasons. You'll see in a second. The Julep is a really terrific warm weather cocktail, and we're gonna compare two recipes for the Mint Julep to get a sense of this drink. According to David Wondrich, writing for Esquire.com, you'll need one teaspoon superfine sugar, three ounces of bourbon, and five to six mint leaves. Whereas Alton Brown, writing for the Food Network, recommends one and a half teaspoons superfine sugar, two and a half ounces of bourbon, 10 mint leaves, and a splash of seltzer water. So you can already see some variations starting just with the list of ingredients there. Both of these recipes recommend muddling the sugar and mint leaves in the bottom of the glass you'll serve the drink in, but pretty much it diverges after that. Alton Brown says to simply add a splash of seltzer water and fill the glass with ice, add the bourbon, and top it off with another seltzer splash. Whereas David Wondrich says to pack the glass with finely cracked ice, add the bourbon, and stir briskly until the outside of the glass frosts. As always, you want to keep a mint sprig aside for a garnish with this drink and give it a few smacks on the cutting board before you slip it into the cup. What that does is it kind of activates the essential oils and makes it more fragrant as a garnish. 
The real question here when comparing these mint julep recipes seems to be whether you want that sugar to be well incorporated into the drink from the beginning, you know, kind of the way David Wondrich stirs it in, or whether you want it to slowly get sweeter as the ice melts. I can personally see a case for both, so I'm not gonna pass judgment here. Instead, what I'm gonna do is throw a third option for the mint julep, which relates to our topic this week. And that option is to make yourself a mint infused simple syrup, and just add a half to three quarters of an ounce of that to your julep in place of the fresh mint and sugar. This is a particularly good option if you're entertaining and you wanna keep the process simple for a large group of people or even batch your drinks in advance, which I'm always a huge proponent for. So let me tell you how I would go about this. First, I'd make a one-to-one -one simple syrup. We'll get into what that means in particular in a few minutes here, and then add a healthy handful of fresh mint to that syrup. I'd let it infuse over medium low heat for about three to five minutes, stirring softly and occasionally, not allowing it to boil. And then I'd basically just skim out the mint and allow the syrup to cool. Now, part of the charm of the mint julep is that you get little nips, little particles of mint as you sip on the tongue because the leaves break down, they tear up a little bit as you muddle them, and you end up inadvertently ingesting some. Most people like this. It's refreshing. So to mimic this effect in your mint syrup, you can set aside a little bit of fresh mint, wait until the syrup is cool right before you serve your drinks, and then either finely chop or immersion blend the fresh mint into the syrup, depending on the desired size you'd like the mint particles to be in the glass. If you don't wanna sip in any mint, obviously skip this step, but I find that it adds a little bit of color and engineered authenticity to what is a batched end product. So now that you've got a nice little case of decision paralysis about how to make your next mint julep, let's move on to the topic of this Barkhart Foundations episode, homemade syrups. The reason why I wanted to cover this topic now is because here in the United States, we've got access to a real bounty of fresh herbs, fruits, berries, and other seasonal produce at the moment. And we've also got some popular summer holidays coming up. So whether you're planning to kick back with a casual cocktail hour at home, or maybe you're planning on traveling and taking your cocktail hour somewhere vacation-y, knowing how to capture some of these beautiful summer flavors in a homemade syrup is pretty much the easiest and most cost-effective way to impress your friends and family with your cocktail skills. So first, we're gonna do a little table of contents here. We're gonna talk about the role of sweetness in cocktails, essentially why syrups are such a great tool. Then we'll go over different syrup bases and production methods. We'll also get into some of the science behind preserving your syrups in a home setting. And we'll round things out with a few recipes and advanced syrup tips for those of you who are a bit more on the adventurous or nerdy side. Sweetness is good. Sweetness means calories and energy. At least that's what our bodies are programmed to think. And that's why we still innately crave sweet things, even though most of us aren't running around at a caloric deficit. Sweetness also helps to balance or mellow out other tastes that can be aversive in large doses, like sourness or bitterness. We don't walk around sucking on gentian or lemons just the thought of a nice Negroni or a whiskey sour can get your mouth watering. Bartenders have been taking advantage of sweetness from the very dawn of the cocktail, and in fact, long before that. So as long as you're taking care to meticulously combine all the other tastes and flavors in your cocktail, it makes sense that we pause on sweetness and give it its due attention. When it comes to using sweeteners like syrups in a cocktail, it's really important to keep balance in mind. Just like too much bitterness or sourness can ruin a drink, so can cloying sweetness. My rule of thumb is to use no more than a quarter to a half ounce of syrup for every two ounces of spirits in a given drink. The presence of bitterness or acidity can boost that a bit, but only slightly. Syrups can also add wonderful color to your cocktails, making them pleasing to both the eye and the palate. So, as we set out here on this sweet, sweet journey together and learn about how to make these syrups at home, keep your mind open to all the sensory possibilities that an excellent syrup can create. The first thing you have to do when you want to make a homemade syrup 
is choose your sweetener. And this is actually a lot more complicated than it might sound. I guess I should amend that. It's not complicated. There's just a lot of options out there. If you're looking at sugar in particular, essentially anything derived from the sugar cane plant, really the two variables are how processed or refined the product is, as well as the size of the granules you're dealing with. On the processed end of the spectrum, you've got your standard granulated baking or table sugar, alongside similar products like super fine sugar. This is exactly what it sounds like. And the reason it's recommended for juleps, if you remember the featured cocktail we just went over, is because when you're adding straight sugar to your cocktails rather than a syrup, small granules dissolve and incorporate better than large ones. Then in the middle, you've got slightly less processed sugars like Florida crystals, sugar in the raw, and a lot of the raw organic cane sugars out there. I really like these when I'm making my syrups at home. I think they have a nice flavor and uh, I like slightly less processed things. And finally, at the far end of the spectrum, you've got stuff like molasses and more exotic sugar products like panela. Molasses is actually a byproduct of the sugar making process and that's why it's got that dark, slightly burnt taste. And then you've got panela, which goes by a ton of different names depending on what country you're in, including jaggery, piloncillo, and rapadura. It's basically a hardened hunk of completely unrefined sugar. Sometimes it comes in the shape of a cone. Finally, fun fact, if you're wondering why I haven't listed brown sugar yet, it's because it's basically a cane sugar with molasses added back in after the fact for flavor. So it doesn't fit neatly into any of the categories above, but of course you can make a syrup with brown sugar. So as you can see, a ton of different sugars available out there and sugar is a great base for a syrup because it's widely available, it's pretty affordable, and you can get it pretty much anywhere. That being said, you do have other sweetener options. Honey is another popular one, and I actually like honey for its versatility, but to tell you why, I have to go on a little bit of a tangent here. There's this really amazing little country store called Echo Hill in a little town called Fleetwood, Pennsylvania. It's right in the heart of Dutch country where you have to look out when you're driving for those little horse-drawn carriages on the road. And I was actually introduced to this place by Modern Bar Cart co-founder Ethan Hall while we were on a break from college way back in the day. And what blew my mind at the time was how many types of honey they had at this little store and at a great price and in giant jars. They've got clover honey, orange blossom honey, buckwheat honey, tupelo honey, and many more besides that. And of course, it makes sense that the honey is going to take on flavor characteristics of the flowers involved in its creation, which is almost like terroir, but for bees. So if you're the kind of person who really likes to tinker with flavor, you might consider what happens when you use different types of honey as a base for your syrups. Finally, you've got your agave nectar, which is a product that you can find at most natural grocery stores. And a lot of people on vegan diets or other specific diets will use it as an alternative to honey or just because they like the flavor of agave nectar. Even though both honey and agave nectar come in somewhat liquid forms, it still helps to make syrups out of them for the purposes of incorporating them into your cocktails more effectively. Since most cocktails are chilled, Honey and agave nectar respond to that cold temperature by reverting to a more solid state, which makes the mixing process messier and less productive. Now, lastly, I'd like to mention a sweetener that you can totally add to your cocktails without any further syrupizing. And because of that fact, it's not going to make an appearance later on in the episode, but I did feel bad leaving it out. That sweetener is maple syrup, which is the processed sap of the maple tree. Growing up in western Massachusetts, we had a good deal of the stuff being produced nearby and in neighboring Vermont, which has a huge reputation for maple. But here's something we don't usually realize here in the U.S. In Canada, they make like a zillion times more maple syrup than Vermont does. They actually have a strategic reserve of maple syrup that holds over 10,000 tons metric, which based on my calculations is over 22 million pounds of maple syrup. Wrap your head around that. 
My grandparents are from Canada, so as you might guess, in my family, we take our maple syrup rather seriously. I'll put it this way. When we went up to visit family when I was a kid, we'd, we'd come back from Canada with literally cases of one liter cans of syrup that you'd have to open with one of those can punches. It was kind of like our own strategic syrup reserve. Now, maple has a few grades based on color and flavor, and the factor that really dictates both is when the maple sap was harvested. The early the sap is harvested, the lighter the color and the subtler the flavor, and the later it's harvested, right up until before the maple trees bud in the spring, the darker and more robust the flavor. An obvious connection I make here is that if you're a bourbon fan, you can totally tailor your maple syrup choice to complement your whiskey in an old-fashioned. If you've got a really strong, high rye bourbon, you might want to go for a dark amber that can stand up to it. But if you're working with a weeded bourbon, maybe a light or medium amber is a more appropriate choice. Once you've selected your sweetener, it's time to look at the tools and methods you'll use to create your cocktail syrup. Obviously, you'll need a stove or a burner, a pot or saucepan of some sort, and some good clean water. And as you're envisioning this process in your head, let's imagine, for the sake of argument, you're using a nice granulated raw cane sugar. I find it helps, you know, when you're listening to instructions via audio to have a picture in your head. If you remember back to your high school chemistry class, you may recall the words solute and solvent being thrown around when describing the process of one substance dissolving into another. This is what happens when you make a syrup. The sweetener is the solute, the thing being dissolved, and the water is the solvent, the thing doing the dissolving. I bring this up because there's a couple things you can do to water to help it dissolve things faster. One is to add heat to the equation, and the other is to mechanically agitate the water by, say, stirring it. This pretty much describes what you need to do to make a homemade syrup. Usually you want to add the water to the pot and let it heat up before adding the sugar, which is then going to cool the overall temperature of the solution as soon as you add it. So you kind of want to give the water a head start. And then you should stir the contents of the pot with a spoon or a whisk until the sweetener is dissolved in the water. Because if you don't and you have the heat on too high, the sugar can sit on the bottom of the pan and actually get a little bit burnt. So you don't want that. One important detail that we've glossed over so far is precisely how much sugar and how much water to add when making a cocktail syrup. If you've ever heard the term simple syrup, this refers to an equal ratio of sugar and water. So if you take out your Pyrex measuring cup and fill it with two cups of water, that's exactly how much sugar you want to add if you're aiming for a simple syrup. The other popular type of syrup out there is what's called a rich simple syrup, which is a two to one ratio of sugar to water. So if you use two cups of water, you're gonna use four cups of sugar. Rich simple syrup takes a bit more heat and a bit more stirring to make because as the sugar gets liquefied, it kind of binds to the water molecules, leaving fewer of those water molecules available to help dissolve the remaining sugar. So the more sugar you add, the more heat and the more mechanical agitation you're going to need to add to the process to help it dissolve. In addition, as you might imagine, rich simple syrup packs a more potent dose of sweetness than an equal amount of simple syrup. So if you taste them side by side, you will probably be able to perceive a noticeable difference. There's a bit of a disagreement out there as to whether you should actually bring your syrup to a full boil when you're making it. Some people I've talked to claim that it affects the flavor and that it should be avoided at all costs. And as far as I'm concerned, really what you plan to do with your syrup, how you plan to treat that syrup once it's made should dictate whether or not you allow it to come to a boil. If you're going to use it all up same day, then there's really no point in boiling it. But if you're planning to store it, then it's a different story, and we'll talk about that later on in the episode. So to review, if you want to make a simple syrup or a rich simple syrup, all you've got to do is assemble your, your tools and ingredients, sugar, water, a pot, stirring utensil, heat up the sugar and the water, and stir until it's dissolved. Pretty simple. But let's say you don't want to stop at simple. What if you want to make a flavored cocktail syrup? The cool thing about heat 
water, and sometimes even sugar, is that they are really great at stripping and retaining flavor from other things. So fruits, herbs, spices, and even vegetables in some cases are all on the table when it comes to flavored syrups. With fruits and herbs, it's best to use fresh when they're available, but with spices, obviously you're going to be adding those to your syrup in dried form most of the time. And really, adding flavor to your syrup only adds two steps to the process. Once your sugar is dissolved, you add your flavoring ingredient or ingredients and stir those for a few minutes to let the flavor infuse. And finally, once you're satisfied with the flavor, you just take a sieve and strain them back out. It's as simple as that. At this point, I know a lot of you are wondering exactly how much of your flavor ingredient to add when you're making a syrup. And fortunately, or I guess unfortunately, depending on how reliant you are on recipes in the kitchen, there's really no set rules. If you're making a strawberry syrup, for example, and you want it to be really powerful, add a lot of strawberries relative to how much syrup you're making. My one word of caution would be to heed this simple culinary principle when you're making your syrup. When it comes to seasonings, you can always add more, but you can't take any away. So especially with powerful spices like, I don't know, a cinnamon or a pepper, it might be best to initially add less than you think you might need and then up the dosage if you want to dial up the potency of that syrup. That's how you avoid having to throw out or dilute a batch of syrup that you made too strong to begin with. It's also a good idea to keep track of how much you add of a certain flavoring ingredient. That way, if you make a syrup and people really enjoy it, you can reproduce it identically in the future, and you can even share the recipe with friends who want to make it for themselves. Once you've made your cocktail syrup, you need to figure out a way to preserve it if you're not going to use it right away. And there are a number of ways you can approach this. First off, let's look at the two biggest culprits that cause syrups to go bad, bacteria and mold. These are things that are floating around or growing literally all over the place, especially in our kitchens and refrigerators. So the first step in preserving your syrup actually happens before you make it, and that is to thoroughly cleanse your kitchen workspace before you produce. This means you want to wipe down all surfaces with an antibacterial cleanser, and certainly be sure to follow other best practices like washing your hands and using clean pots and utensils. Just, you know, any common sense thing that you would do before cooking dinner. On the stove, one thing you can do to prevent bacteria from forming is to bring your syrup to a light boil. We're not talking like pasta water boil here. Just bring it up to a simmer where you've got little bubbles rising from the bottom of the pot and steam escaping from the surface and leave it there for, you know, one to two minutes. This indicates that you're in the neighborhood of 212 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the boiling point of water. Now, I spent a lot of time in a commercial kitchen around people like chefs and caterers, and one principle they all follow is that you want to chill down your food as quickly as possible once it's cooked. And the thinking behind this is that bacteria and mold tend to grow best in neutral temperatures, temperatures where you or I would be comfortable. So the more quickly you bring that food from hot to cold, the smaller the window will be for bad stuff to get in there and grow. Technically, this is also true for syrups, except... Unless you're going to use it all right away, you're probably going to be storing it in a clean, sealed container. So if you transfer your syrup to a carefully sterilized bottle or mason jar right away and seal the top, you don't really need to worry about refrigerating it or, or getting it cool as quickly as possible. In my life, I do actually find myself in a situation where I need to chill down my syrups right away, and that's because I frequently make batched cocktails for events and social gatherings, and I hate sticking hot syrup in the fridge because it causes condensation, and then I have to wipe down my fridge shelves, and it also raises the overall temperature of the fridge, which puts my other food at risk. But one method I devised for really quickly chilling down my syrups is something I call a double cooler or a double chiller. And I call it that because it works roughly the same way a double boiler works on the stove. If you're melting chocolate, for example, you put your chocolate in a small saucepan and you place that saucepan in a slightly larger saucepan filled with boiling water. And what the double boiler ensures is that you're not going to burn the chocolate. The double cooler works in much the same way. And the real benefit is that you cool your liquid really quickly without diluting it. So how do I do this? 
I use one of those large stainless steel mixing bowls that you can pick up on Amazon or at Ikea for cheap. And I do that because uh, metal is very good at conducting temperature. I then fill that bowl about halfway with cold water and large ice cubes. And then I place my saucepan filled with the hot syrup directly into the bowl, making sure that the water and ice are in contact with the bottom and sides of the pot. Using this method, you can easily chill down a liter or two of syrup in about half an hour. And it's one of my favorite bar hacks. I love, love, love this because it's so effective. And now it's yours too. Getting back to preserving your syrup, there are a couple other things you can do to battle against bacteria and mold. One is to make the pH or level of acidity in your syrup inhospitable to the little microbes that spoil it. For bacteria, this means lowering the pH by adding something like citric acid, which is basically just powdered lemon juice. So if you've got some citrus lying around, that can help, but you can also pick up citric acid for cheap on Amazon, and believe me, a little goes a long way. For mold, it gets a bit trickier because preventing that is more of a chemical thing, not just a pH thing. So if you really want to nerd out, check out mold inhibitors like potassium sorbate or sodium benzoate, both of which can be found on the ingredient lists of many canned or bottled products. Finally, the richness or thickness of your syrup can play a huge role in avoiding spoilage. Formally, this property is measured using something called a BRIX score, B-R-I-X, which is based on the specific gravity of your liquid. And in normal language, basically what happens, what this means, is the thicker your syrup is, the fewer water molecules are available to host microbes because they're all busy stuck to sugar molecules. In this respect, rich simple syrups are better than regular simple syrups. So if you're planning on storing your syrup in the fridge and using it over the course of a month or so, maybe consider using a rich simple syrup to avoid spoilage. If you want to get a bit scientific with this, you can actually calculate the specific gravity of your syrup as long as you have a little digital kitchen scale available. All you do is you get your Pyrex measuring cup, you fill it with two cups or 500 ml of water, doesn't really matter. You weigh it, you dump it out, and then you fill it with an equal volume of syrup and weigh that. The syrup is going to be heavier than the water, logically, and to arrive at the specific gravity of your syrup, all you do is divide the weight of the syrup by the weight of the water, and you're going to come out with some decimal that's between one and two. And the higher the number, the higher the decimal, the thicker your syrup is. Before we move on to a few recipes and pro tips for at-home syruping, I do have one common misconception I'd like to clear up, and that is regarding the use of vodka to prevent bacteria growth in syrups. Technically, if you add a tablespoon of ethyl alcohol on top of your syrup, yes, it's gonna float on top and prevent any bacteria from getting into your syrup. It's gonna form a protective layer. But so does a properly sterilized lid or cap. So there's really no reason to use the vodka float method. And if you're thinking at this point, well, then I'll just mix the vodka into the syrup instead of floating it, then yeah, that might help. But you need to add so much alcohol to your syrup to prevent bacteria growth that by the time you're done, you've got more of a cordial or a liqueur, and then you have more alcohol in your cocktails than perhaps you were planning for. So forget the vodka and focus on a clean workspace, a properly thickened syrup, and maybe some acidification if you want to preserve your syrups in a home setting. Now let's round out this episode with a couple syrup pro tips, ideas, and recipes. First off, I'd recommend picking up a copy of Liquid Intelligence by Dave Arnold if this episode has piqued your interest in syrups. There's a really great five-page spread on sweetness and cocktails with a lot of useful tips. So even though it's a bit of a pricey book, it's literally indispensable if you're looking to really take your home cocktail game to the next level. Related to that, I do have a bit of an admission to make regarding the accuracy of my measurement claims earlier in the episode when we were talking about, you know, simple syrups and rich simples. And that is that when you're comparing equal volumes of sugar and water, they're not really equal. They're pretty close, but not quite the same. And that's because the densities are different. So if this bothers you, and you feel a bit betrayed by me, the solution is to measure out your sugar and your water by weight 
instead of by volume in order to truly achieve your one-to-one or two-to-one ratios. And this goes for honey and agave as well. In fact, it goes more for honey and agave because both of those have even higher densities than granulated sugar, making a one-to-one or a two-to-one even harder to achieve just by eyeballing the volume. Now, for most people, this isn't a big deal because it's hard for your taste buds to identify even fairly large changes in sugar concentration beyond a certain point. But hey, if you're one of those folks who just wants to be consistent, 100% accurate, I get it. Go pick up a digital kitchen scale and you will be all set to measure your syrup ratios by weight instead of by volume. Now, I do have a couple recipes I think you should try if you're really getting curious about diving into syrups. One is for an ingredient called orgeat, which is one of the most interesting and important ingredients in many of the most popular tiki drinks. Orgeat is an almond-based syrup infused with orange blossom water to give it a really complex, rich flavor. There is some straining and blending involved, so I'd recommend picking up a handheld immersion blender and perhaps a nut milk bag, which is basically a a fine mesh bag that's a little bit finer than traditional cheesecloth that allows you to easily filter things. Another recipe is something I tried recently, and that's for a rose syrup. I just had the idea, I threw it together and wrote down my measurements so that I could share it here with you. And the cool thing about rose as a flavor is that if you're careful with it, it doesn't steal the show. It's one of those amazing backup flavors that really ties together the cocktail and can complement things really well. To make it, you'll need two cups of sugar, two cups of water, and about a cup to a cup and a half of culinary grade dried rose petal. And that's about one and a half or two ounces by weight. The one disadvantage here with using dried rose petals is that they will absorb some of the syrup. So you'll see a little bit of a reduced yield, but if you need a certain amount, just anticipate that and make a little bit extra to account for that absorption. Two quick things before I sign off here. One, I want to invite you to share your syrup experiments with us on social media. So when you whip up something at home, make a cocktail with it snap a pic and tag us at modern bar cart on instagram and facebook we love seeing what you all do with your newfound cocktail skills so be sure to give us a shout out if you come up with something you really like and now to get you started here's a list of flavors i know or suspect make excellent cocktail syrups ginger rosemary basil cucumber mint strawberries raspberries blackberries. You know what? Most berries, actually. Vanilla, cinnamon, black pepper, jalapenos, and other fragrant peppers. Coriander and or cilantro. Fennel, caraway, turmeric, pineapple, hops. And finally, I guess just avoid things that smell or taste like feet. That's it for this episode. So please go forth now and populate the world with delicious syrups. Hey everybody, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is, the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here, and by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. 
This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember, folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and production assistance by Samantha Reed and a little bit of syrup insanity by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2018.